Well, we're starting a series today, uh, a new series as we begin the year called The Little Things. Uh, how many of you know that the little things matter? Come on. They do. The little things matter. And sometimes we don't look at the little things, we don't focus on the little things, but the thing that I've discovered is if we don't spend time with the little things, these little things eventually become big things. You know what I mean? Over time, they compound. They, the little things just get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and, and I don't have to spend much time illustrating that for you. You've probably seen that in your life. You've, you've seen it with like, here, just for example, mold in your shower. Come on. Now, I, I know some of you, like when, when I was a single man, uh, in college, I'm not sure I ever cleaned my shower. And I know some of you are just like, that's disgusting. But the thing I've learned is if you get just a little bit, all of a sudden it starts to grow, right? Isn't that true? And that can be good, you know, and that can be bad. And I'm not saying the, the, the mold is good. I'm just saying just in general, there can be good things and there can be bad things that can start out little, then eventually become big. And, and, and you get what I'm saying. Matter of fact, the Bible says that, that, and I love the way that Song of Solomon says this, but Solomon says it this way, that, that it's the little foxes that ruin the vineyards. Isn't that interesting? I always think about that story in the Bible of Samson. And he, re, he ties the tails of the foxes together, which I think is just kind of a weird thing to do. And he, and he, he sets them on fire and he releases them into this, this, uh, this field and it burns down the entire field. It's just a crazy scene in the Bible. But hey, if you ever want to read an interesting, uh, chat, uh, an interesting book in the Bible, read Judges. I'm just telling you, uh, it's a mess. And so Samson gives us this illustration of how just these foxes can burn down this field. And yet that's the same thing that Solomon was saying is that, that somehow if we don't tend to the little foxes, that what can happen is our entire world can be devastated. That the harvest that we long for can be affected. Matter of fact, the Bible talks so much about this idea of the little things. Like when Jesus talks about the yeast and how the yeast helps the bread and, and if we don't tend to the yeast that, that what can happen is it can affect the whole loaf of bread. Yes? And so when you read the scriptures you see that and then there's this amazing thing that Jesus says that I thought was so powerful. He says when we are faithful, listen to this, when we are faithful with little we will be given much. See how important the little things are? Not only is it important to keep us from bad things it's important that we are tending to the little things so that we can receive the good things. And so these little things really do matter. And so what I want to do over the next few weeks is spend a little time talking about the little things. Talking about the things that matter most. Now, I, I don't know if you've been to the doctor recently. Uh, normally when you go to the doctor, uh, there's some Things that they do right at the beginning of your appointment, right? Uh, and, and one of the first things they do is, well, the, one of the first things they do is they take your weight, which, you know, we all love that part. You're like, you know, can I, can I, can I put my phone down? Can I take my shoes off? It's like they don't care, you know, that you've got all this added weight. I've got like five pounds added with clothing, but they don't care. They just get on the scale and they tell you that, right? But then the other thing they do when you get into the, into the what do they call it, examination room. Well, the other thing they do is they what? They take your temperature, right? They're, they take your temperature. Nowadays, they take it before you even get there. Like, you know, you can't even go in the room before they take your temperature because they're trying to see if you're sick or if you have COVID-19 or whatever. And so we know this image of having our temperature taken. And so what I want to do for a little bit is take our temperature. I want to spend our time over the next few weeks taking our temperature. Because see, if we don't ever take our temperature, we'll never know if there's a problem. Do you see what I'm getting at? In our lives, so often we don't slow down enough to take our temperature. And the next thing you know, we find ourselves in a bad spot. Perhaps we're running a fever. Perhaps we've grown, we've grown cold. And we don't even know it. And so what I want to do for a few minutes is take our temperature. Because this is what Jesus says. Listen to this. In Luke chapter 5, 29 through 32, Jesus is speaking. 
And he's speaking to really some Pharisees. And if you don't know what those are, those are religious leaders of the day, Jewish religious leaders. And, and they were pretty particular about things, uh, making sure that they honored God through all the law and all that kind of stuff. And, and so Jesus is hanging out with some people that would be considered unclean by the religious establishment. OK, and so Jesus is speaking. He says, then Levi came to a great feast in his own house. And Levi was a tax collector and Jesus shouldn't have been hanging out with him. And there were a number of other tax collectors and others that sat down with them. And, and so they're sitting around and then the Pharisees show up and they're and their scribes and the Pharisees complained against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Do you see the comparison? And we probably even put tax collectors in the same category as they did. Am I wrong? <laughs> Verse 31. Then Jesus answered and said to them, listen to this. Those who are well have no need for a physician. But those who are sick are the ones that need that physician. Do you see? So, so, so what Jesus is saying is, is there's no need for you to have a physician if you're not sick. But what he's trying to get at is that all of us, whether we like it or not, are in the same boat. And I don't care how far you've gone, how long you've known Jesus, or how, 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 how many years you've been in the church, or whatever it is. The Bible says that we have need of Jesus. That we have need of the healer. That we have need of the great physician to help us. And so here's the thing. And this is the great equalizer for all of us today. This is important. Whether you're good, whether you're bad, whether you're in the middle, wherever you are today. Whether you're at go or start or you're getting close to the finish. Here, here's what I got to say to you. We all have need of Jesus' healing in our life. And the only way that we get it is that we tend to the things that he tells us to tend to. So that we can find the healing that we need. See, Jesus came, listen to me, Jesus came to heal the sick. He came to make us better. And so how do we go about seeing that realized in our life? Well, one of the things we have to do is we got to take our temperature. And so here's what I want to do. Over the next few weeks, I have five questions. Five questions that I'm going to ask you. And what I'm going to ask you to do with these five questions, uh, and if you can't be here all five weeks, that's fine. You can catch it online. But I want you to get these questions. And I'm not going to tell you all of them because then you wouldn't come back, and I'm not going to do it. But I'm going to give you the first question today. And this, these questions, what I want you to do is over the week, like as you get your question over the, over the week, the remainder of the week, I want you to spend time asking yourself this question. Just, just reflecting, just asking, listen, just asking the Holy Spirit to speak to you, just asking God to interact with you around this one question each week. Because I believe this, if you'll create some space for God, if you'll start to listen to God, if you'll start to, 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 to allow yourself to reflect, to, to ask the question, I believe God will answer. I, I do. And so my heart for us today is that we would spend time asking these questions over the next few weeks. And so you're wondering what the first question is. Well, here it is in a nutshell. You ready? Everybody ready? Everybody okay? Here we go. How in love with Jesus are you right now? Really? How in love with Jesus are you right now? Really? And I add the really part because sometimes we just go, I'm fine, I'm good. And I want to ask, I just want to press in a little bit more. How in love with Jesus are you right now, really? Now, I don't know how you'd answer that question. I don't know where you are. I know that many of us has had a hard month or a hard year or a hard life. And sometimes answering that question isn't easy to answer. But I, I think it's an important question. Now, I think it's an important question for somebody that maybe doesn't even have a relationship with Jesus. Because like I asked the question, how in love with Jesus? And you'd have to say, well, I'm not in love with him at all. And I'm so glad you're here because I believe you're going to hear a story today about a guy that loves you so much. His name's Jesus. He was the son of God, came from heaven for you and for me because he loves you that much. It's, it's such a great story. It's such a great thing. And so my heart for you today is you'd grab hold of that and, and maybe just maybe for the first time enter into a relationship with a God that loves you. But for those of you in the room that maybe would say, I'm a Christ follower, uh, could you, could you be honest? Could you say, hey, yeah, I'm struggling, or I'm doing good, or 
Here's another way to ask it. Uh, and this is how some of the, the, the people, uh, well, I'll just say, in the Methodist movement, one of the questions that they would ask in their small groups, they called them bands, they would ask this question, listen, so to even come to the band, to the, to, the, to the small group, the first question they would ask people is this, how is it with your soul? Like that's how they would start. Imagine if I went to coffee with you and I asked you that question every time. You wouldn't want to go to coffee with me probably. Because more than like a lot of times it's, we're asking, how are you doing? How are you doing? No, no. How is it with your soul? What's going on in here? What's going on in your spirit? What's going on? That gets to the question, doesn't it? Is that, what's going on right now? How, how about this? How's your frustration level? Frustration is code word for anger. A lot of times. It's Christian code for anger. I'm so frustrated, right? We've talked about this. What you really mean is you're angry. You don't want to admit that you're angry, so you say frustrated, it's more acceptable, right? That's like when something's really messed up or you think someone's dumb or weird, you say they're interesting. <laughs> well, that's interesting. It's just the nice way of saying what really you don't want to say. And so I think sometimes, I just ask you, how's your anger right now? You know? How's that going? How's your, how's your bitterness? How's your, how's your unforgiveness? I mean, shoot, we just came out of the holidays. Who made you a mad? Which family member did it? Right? And, so, so, and the reason I'm asking you is not just, not just that you deal with the problem, but you have to understand that the problem that you're dealing with, and this is so, if you can get this, it'll change everything. And it's really kind of odd at first, but if you start to grab hold of it, it makes sense. And that is this, that every horizontal problem we have points to a vertical thing. It points to a vertical relationship. Because see, see, see what it is, is if my relationship with God is right, then it actually helps me deal with the horizontal. See, see when I can't deal with the horizontal anymore, something's going on here. And that's so important that we see this. And that's why this question of how in love with Jesus am I right now really, really matters. It is something that we have to consider. Here, let me ask it a different way. Here it is. is has, has your relationship with Jesus grown cold? Now, you know, it, 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 it's still there. Like if you died, you'd go to heaven. I mean, he still loves you, of course. But, but, but has it grown cold? And so as we think about taking our temperatures, right? Uh, as, we, as we think about putting that thermometer in our mouth or sticking that thermometer in our head and, and we start to gauge where we are, have we grown cold? Are we cold to the relationship that we say matters most of all? And so this question, I think, is really a helpful question to each of us as we think about what to do. And so, so what I want to do is help you, come on, I want to help you turn up the heat right now. Because if, if you've grown cold, if you've allowed some things to get in the way, if there's some things keeping you from the most enjoyable, most amazing relationship in all of the world, then I want to help you today. And so here's the idea I want to share. Here's kind of the metaphor. Listen, thermometers, listen, thermometers check temperature, right? So you know what a thermometer is. We've talked about it. You stick it on the head, do it in your mouth. And if you're a baby, well, never mind. Did anybody get that? Come on. You guys are slow on the uptake this morning. You gotta, you gotta wake up a little bit. And so thermometers check the temperature, right? But thermostats determine temperature, correct? So we have thermostats in our house. We go to the thermostat and we say, ooh, it's kind of cold in here. So we hit the thermostat up a little bit. And so, you know, some of you, you, you go all the way up to 80. That never happens in my house. I think my thermostat never gets above like 65. And people, my kids, my wife, they hate it, you know. And I'm always like, well, put some clothes on. You'll be fine. Just, just put something on. You're good. We can always solve that problem without spending money, see. But here's what I'm getting at. Listen, listen, listen. It's one thing to take your temperature to assess what's going on. It's another thing to be a person that determines the temperature in your life. 
And see, God doesn't want you to just be a thermometer. God wants you to be a thermostat. He wants believers in Jesus Christ to not just take temperature, but to make sure that they're affecting the temperature, that they're actually doing the things, understanding that they have the power, come on, to determine the temperature, that you literally can turn it up or turn it down. And that's the image that I want you to get in your mind as we think about these questions that we're asking, because these questions will help you turn it up. Because if you've gotten to a place where some of these things have gotten down, you can actually affect the temperature in your life by simply doing a couple of things. These are tried and true things that God has been talking about for many, many years. As you think about what it would look like for that relationship with Jesus to no longer be cold or lukewarm or kind of warm. No, no, you want it hot, white hot. That's what you want. You want to be able to say, man, I'm in so in love with Jesus right now. Uh, uh, How about this? For some of you, when you were younger, you think back to a time that he meant everything to you. But if you were to look at it today, you'd have to say that's just not true. That That the things of this world have beat it out of you. You know what I'm talking about? Life hurts sometimes. We all experience challenge and pain. And and sometimes what happens is we stop seeing how good he is. Even when, because we're dealing with so many bad things. And it's so hard and challenging. And I just want to call us again. And this isn't about guilt. This is about us coming back to the, the very thing that matters most. And that's our love for him. Because at the end of the day, he gave everything for us. And, you know, I, I love to look at the disciples sometimes because I've seen myself in them. You know, I mean, you probably do as well. Like when you read the Bible and you read some of the disciples and you're like, yeah, I could totally do that. Or, oh, yeah, I would have done that for sure. You know what I mean? And, 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 and I, was, I was reflecting a little bit on Peter. Uh, Peter loved Jesus. You know what I mean? Like he loved Jesus. He was willing to do anything for Jesus. Matter of fact, he was the guy that stood up and said, look, when everybody else deserts you. I won't do it. I'm all in, no matter what. If it costs me my life, I'm there. Whatever it is, Jesus, whatever you want. Come on, come on. Have you ever said that in your life? Have you ever said this part of like, Jesus, thank you for saving me. Thank you for giving me everything that I need. Thank you for freeing me from my sin. Thank you, God. I give you my life. Whatever it is you need from me, whatever it is you want from me, it's yours. But then sometimes things change. Life happens. We start to drift. We stop, to rem- we, stop, we stop remembering, come on, what Jesus has done for us. And we start to embrace the things of this world and the cares of this world. And, and the next thing you know, our love for Jesus has grown cold. Or, or maybe, just maybe, it's just been crowded out by the things of this world. It's been crowded out by the noise of this world. And the love that we had at first is gone. And, and I, I love Peter's story because I don't know if you know the story, but, but, but when, when Jesus was taken and arrested and he was, a, the, well, the following day, they were going to take him to a cross and, and murder him on this cross, crucify him. He was going to die a horrible death. Peter, in the back of his mind, has said, I'm not going to let... I'm not going to desert him. I'm not going to leave him. But yet, perhaps you know the Bible. Perhaps you know Peter's story. Listen to this. In Luke 22, 60 through 62, this is kind of towards the end of it. Peter did exactly what he said he wouldn't do. Have you ever done exactly what you said you wouldn't do? See, this is the sickness that I'm talking about. I think sometimes when we talk about sickness, we, we talk about just, you know, physical sickness or I've, I've got some really secret sins that nobody knows about. I think it's more than that. The sickness is, is our inability to honor God with our lives. Our inability to do what we say. As a matter of fact, a lack of integrity that we all have if we're not close to Jesus. And so Peter is having this interaction with this girl. And and watch this. Immediately, while he was speaking, the rooster crowed. And Jesus said that the rooster would crow after Jesus had done what? Denied him three times. And the Lord turned 
And this is one of the most unsettling uh, verses in all the Bible for me. In, in 61, it said the Lord, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Think about that. You've just denied your Lord and your Savior. And then in a distance, Jesus catches eye with Peter. If I was Peter in that moment, I can't imagine the weight yeah. I would feel. As Jesus looks me in the eye. Now it doesn't say that Jesus looked him in the eye with contempt. It doesn't say that he looked him in the eye with this kind of disappointment. Isn't that interesting? That we read that into the text. Because you imagine, right? Jesus looking at it. Oh! Right? But it doesn't say that. It just says that Jesus looked at him. And I think that's kind of an interesting thing to think about. I wonder if Jesus was looking at him with compassion. But maybe he was looking at him saying, man, I know this is hard, brother. Because if you were in Peter's shoes, that's a hard lesson. And it says, then Peter remembered the word of the Lord. How he had said to him before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And then watch this. So sad. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. He was, he was broken over the fact that he had denied his Savior. And, and, and as we read this story, it's so gripping of a story. Because here's the reality. We've not, we may not have been in that courtyard that day. But there have been times in our life where we've walked away. We're, we're, we're literally, we've professed him in church and denied him with our life. Yeah. We've professed him in the public arena and then privately denied him. See, see what I'm getting at, guys, is that sometimes in our life, what happens is we're good on the outside, but we're not good on the inside. And here's the thing you have to understand is it's the inside that matters. Because if you will contain and deal with the inside, you will be able to deal with the outside. Because the Bible says if you'll work on the inside, the outside will take care of itself. Yeah. And the way that you need to understand this is that when you come face to face with this question, am I in love with him? Do I want him? Do, do, I, do I desire Jesus in my life first and foremost? Do, is that true? What happens is it draws you to a particular way of living. And that particular way of living leads to a transformative experience inside your spirit that then leads to behavior on the outside. And this is what we're trying to get at. See, Peter was struggling. Matter of fact, the Bible says that he wept bitterly because of what he had done. See, Peter was grieved. He was grieved. He knew he had, he had not honored the Lord. He knew that he had, quote, messed up. He was grieved. And, and, and here's the thing. This is so important. Oftentimes, listen, oftentimes, that's the beginning of the healing journey. See, when you know you've grieved the Father, when you know you grieved the relationship, when, when you've created tension, so to speak, in the relationship, let me say this to you. If you're here today and that's your journey, friends, that's a gift to you. Do you understand? That's a gift. I love the way that Henry Cloud says it. He, Henry Cloud is a Christian therapist and he, he talks about that in a relationship, when you get to a place where you've had so many conversations over and over and over again and things don't change, what you begin to feel is what? Hopeless. And what Henry Cloud says is that hopelessness you feel is a gift from God. And the reason it's a gift from God is it causes you to have a different conversation. It causes you to do something different. It causes you to stop doing what you've always done. Sometimes it causes you to have a clarifying conversation that says, I'm no longer going to have this conversation anymore. Huh? Sometimes it causes you to have a conversation that says, you know what? I'm not going to be in relationship in this way anymore. I'm going to have a different conversation. The hopelessness I feel right now is actually going to lead me to healing. And I think that's what Peter was experiencing. He was grieved and he knew he had not done it right. And yet that grieving that he felt was going to be the very thing that led him to the healing that he needed. Do you understand? And see, see, Peter was trying to help us. Jesus was trying to help us see that even though Peter had messed it up, even though Peter had screwed it up, it wasn't the end. Yeah. 
Aren't you so glad that it's not the end? I'm just so glad that, that, that when I walk away or when I let things grow cold, it's not the end for me. But somehow God doesn't say, well, if you, if you, if you, you know, say three of these and do that and give this much money, uh, then maybe I'll love you again. And if you were taught that growing up, if you were in some kind of Christian faith that told you you had to do things to get God to love you, it's not what the Bible teaches. See, God's not like that. And that's why I think when Jesus was looking across the courtyard, he wasn't looking at, at, at Peter with this condemning gaze. Because the Bible says that Jesus had compassion on his kids. He grieved. He was, the reason he went to the cross was because he had compassion on us. He didn't look at us and say, you worms. He says, I love you so much. I'm willing to do everything it takes to get you back. And so when you think about maybe things growing cold in your life, you know how you get it back? Oh, Lord Jesus. You look at Jesus again. You look at what he's done for you. You start to, to, to see it again. And, and see what happens is with Peter is that this, this grieving led to a form of what? Repentance. That he, he, he knew he had done wrong. And he made a decision that he was going to do something different. He knew that he was going to do something different. He didn't know what he was going to do because he didn't know how this thing was going to play out. But he was grieved. And here's what the Bible says. Listen to this. In Acts 3.19. Now, listen, repent of your sins and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. Friends, I think we've lost what it means to live a life of repentance. To live a life of repentance doesn't mean you're bad. It means you know you're sick. Yeah. It means you know with humility you need God. Yeah. There's nothing wrong or bad about repentance. But isn't it true when we hear that word we think something's bad? And friends, all repentance means is I turn and go in a different direction. I recognize there's a problem. I haven't loved you with my whole heart this year, Jesus, or the last few months. And I want to get that right. And so I repent. And the Bible says if I will repent, that God will forgive. Look at that. He will wipe away my sins. And here's the thing. What we do is we categorize sins into certain behaviors, right? We're good at it, right? Don't see this movie. Don't eat too much. Don't drink too much. Like we have all these things that we identify as sin. But friends, the greatest sin of all is self-reliance. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. That's where rebellion comes from. And so this self-reliance that we have is the thing that steals everything that God wants. And God says, if you'll come to me, whether it's a willful sin or whether it's a drifting sin or whether it's just self-reliance, good old fresh rebellion and pride, then you come to me. And when you come to me, it'll be wiped away. Yeah. I love that. I love that when I come back to Jesus, come on, that he doesn't say, well, you got to go around again. He doesn't say, hey, do a few laps, then we'll talk. He doesn't say that at all. He says, you come, come to me, child. Come to me. I love you so much. Come to me and I'll wipe away everything. And so here there's two thoughts I have as we get close to ending. The first one is this. And this is what we need to do. If you want to go back to this place of where he's the number one, when he's the, the, the white hot heat in your life, come on, where he is number one, as you answer this question, how in love with Jesus are you really? Here's a few things that you need to do to get there. The first is, come on, repent for letting your heart grow cold. Just tell him, Lord, you're right. You know, I'm just so grateful that my pastor just asked me this question today because it's helping me see that I've allowed some things to grow cold and I don't want to live that way. Lord, I want you to be number one. And, and, and here's, here, here's it. If you don't know this in the scripture, there's this a beautiful thing that happens. So Peter says, no, denies Jesus three times. And you think, oh, no, what's going to happen to Peter? Well, if you flip over to the Gospel of John, we have this amazing interaction between Jesus and Peter. So Jesus or, or Peter is out fishing. 
right? So Jesus, Jesus has been crucified. He's out fishing. And John tells this story of Peter and John in the boat. And, and they, they look and they notice that there's somebody on the shore. And the person on the shore is Jesus. And so they have this interaction where they finally come into shore. And they're having this interaction around the fire. And, and what's cool is Jesus had made them some fish. And they're actually sitting around this fire and they're having some fish together and they're eating this fish. And this is, this is the story. Look, Jesus loved his disciples. Jesus loved Peter. Matter of fact, Jesus loves you. And listen to me. Look at this. And this is in John 21. So when they had eaten breakfast, because Jesus had made them some scrambled eggs, <laughs> Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? Listen, he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. Verse 17, he said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Now, can you imagine being Peter? Like, yes, Jesus, I love you. I've said it three times. Can you imagine? And so, 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 so this is what he says. Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know that you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. You know, one of the things I love most about this passage of scripture is do you notice do you notice the three? Do you notice the three questions? See, Peter denied Jesus three times. In this moment, Jesus is asking Peter three questions. Do you love me? See, what's happening in this passage of Scripture is Jesus is restoring Peter. And what's so amazing about Peter's story is as Jesus <laughs> restores Peter... As, as, as Peter recognizes his need for Jesus, as, he, as he's in this process of restoring Peter, I love that Jesus knows in the back of his mind what he's doing. He knows exactly why he's doing it. He knows exactly what he's doing for Peter. See, Jesus wanted to restore Peter. Why? Come on. It's because he loved him. He loved him. He loved him so much and he wanted to make sure that he didn't walk through life with a limp. That somehow he was just going to walk through life being the guy that denied Jesus. Can you think about that? That God had a different plan for him. But isn't it true that sometimes in our life that we get limps? Sometimes we make mistakes. Sometimes we do things that don't honor God. And the next thing you know, we carry this with us over and over and over. And we live a crippled spiritual existence. And God says, don't do it. You come to me. You come to me. And Jesus is saying to you right now, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And if your answer is yes, you know I do, well then be embraced by the Father again and recognize that he loves you. And here's the other thing that I love about Jesus is he saw more in Peter than Peter saw in himself. He saw what Peter was going to do. He knew that it was on that man that the church would be built he knew that it was through that man that the Holy Spirit would come into the world at Pentecost. See, it was through that man that God was going to do great things. This weak man, this man that had denied Jesus, this man that had lived his life in this way or that way, but this guy was God's guy and he was going to do something great through him. And you know what was the difference between Peter and us sometimes? Is that Peter in that moment was surrendered to the possibility. And if you would just simply surrender yourself to the possibility, God will do great things through you. And that's why he put you on this planet. And so my heart for us is that we would repent for any area of our life that's grown cold. And then finally, number two, is that we would re reprioritize our relationship with Jesus. That we just simply reprioritize it. Have you ever heard this passage of scripture in Matthew? It's one of my favorite passages of scripture, but Matthew 6, 33. But seek what? First, seek first the kingdom of God 
and his righteousness and all these things will be added. Do you notice what the thing, what the Bible says there? Seek first, not second, not third, not fourth, not fifth. You getting it? Seek first the kingdom of God. And whose righteousness? His righteousness. The Bible says your righteousness is filthy rags. The Bible says that when we come into a relationship with Jesus, Jesus takes our filthy rags of righteousness, so-called righteousness, and gives us his righteousness. And we literally put on his garment of righteousness. They're, they're not your garment, they're his garment. And, and why is that important? Because you did nothing to deserve them. They were a gift to you from God. Nothing to deserve them. You cannot do this or that to get it. All you can do is surrender your life to him and God gives it to you freely. See, when you seek first the kingdom of God, you get the righteousness that you need and everything else is going to be added to you because now you're in right relationship with Jesus. See, we got to reprioritize this. We got we to remember that this is what matters. Here, here, let me say it simple. And you guys hear me say this all the time. You ready for it? Very simple. Here it is. Put him first. Put him first. Put him first in your finances. Put him first in your hours. Put him first in your minutes. Put him first in your relationships. Put him first at your job. Put him first in your decision making. Put him first in your relationship. Come on, you're starting to get it. Put him first. 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 See everybody? Everybody say it with me. Put him first. See, see, we're called to put him first. Because see, this is one thing you have to understand that God will never compete for his glory. He won't do it. And he doesn't care how, uh, <laughs> he doesn't care how, um, um, how smart we think we are. That maybe, I, you know, I'll do it this way, God, or I'll do it this way. We come up with a, no. There are certain things that God said there's an order. And this is one of them. And the order matters. And so we've got to put him first. I love how Exodus 23 says this. You shall have no other gods before me. And you're like, well, pastor, I don't have no gods in my life. Come on. I don't have no gods in my life. I don't, have, I don't, I don't do that. I don't have like some little shiny Buddha sitting in my house. I don't have incense going to some god. I don't, I don't do that. You know, I don't worship Shiva or whatever, whoever that god is. I, I, I don't do that. See, I don't think it's, I think what happens is that we have idolatry in our life. We are worshiping certain gods and we don't even know it. Because here's the simplest way to know if you have an idol in your life. And, and I think it's the best definition I've ever seen. And it is that you take a good thing and make it an ultimate thing. You take a good thing and make it an ultimate thing. And once it becomes an ultimate thing, it's, it sits on the throne of your heart. And if it's sitting on the throne of your heart, you're out of order. And the Bible said that you're in sin because, because you have placed a God before the God of the universe. Do you see what I'm getting at? And so, so I don't know what you have going on in your life. But I see this happen a lot with relationships. That, that, that relationships become more important to us than God. I see it happen with certain addictions, certain behaviors that we have. Where I need that thing more than I need that. You know, and I don't know what it is. But the Bible says he wants to be first. And so if there's anything on your throne, then, then just reprioritize that. Say, Lord, I repent. I need your help. And I'm going to put you back on the throne. Lord, I want you on the throne of my life. Now, how about this? In Proverbs 3, 9 through 10, I love this. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruit of all of your increase. Have you increased this year? Have you had any increase? Have you had any increase there, there, or wherever? Then you honor the Lord with the first fruits. Make sure you give him the 10% of that first fruit. So that, so that there's honor. And, and you know what happens? Look at verse 10. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Come on. Don't you want that? Don't you want everything to be filled with plenty to overflow? Jesus, I want that. And the way I do it is I put him first. I love that, the way that Psalm 27 says this. Listen, Psalm 27, 4. One thing, listen. One thing I have desired of the Lord that I will seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire, come on, inquire in his temple. Oh, what a glorious thing to be so single-minded 
that the thing that I want most, the thing that I desire most, is to be with Jesus, to prioritize him above all things. And that's what we need, isn't it? Is we've got to, re, we've got to repent of the areas that have gone cold. We've got to reprioritize Jesus and our relationship with Jesus. And so the question I have for you today that you can take with you this week is how in love with Jesus are you right now, really? As we come to the end, I want to encourage you around something very specific. This next week, you have an opportunity to reprioritize Jesus as we come together as a church to pray and to fast. Now, I don't know if you've ever prayed uh, or fasted, for that matter. Uh, But I do know this. This week is a great week to learn how, to practice. There's all kinds of resources on our app. If you go there, you can find them. But it teaches you, like, matter of fact, we have places that teach you how to pray. We have some places that teach you what fasting is. Uh, If you say to me, Pastor, I can't fast. My doctor won't allow me. I get it, okay? But there's lots of things you can do. I typically do something called a Jewish fast, which is where you fast uh, from sunup to sundown. Uh, That works really good in our family. Um, It still allows us to have meals at night as a family, and so it allows us to do some things, some flexibility. Now, you may feel led by God to do an entire uh, full fast, you know, uh, where you don't eat at all. some people fast, um, they, they do something called a Daniel fast. A Daniel fast is just where you don't do, um, you don't eat meats and sweets, basically. Uh, and you would spend time with that. Uh, so there's a variety of ways you can approach it. If you can't do a food fast, you can fast things like, I don't know, Instagram. Lord knows your life will be better if you do that. And so, so, so there's things you can do. But what I want to encourage you to do is participate. Participate. Even if you can't, you know, show up every night, still participate. Uh, But if you can come, come and learn. Because not only is this a time for us to pray, but it's also a time for us to help people learn how to pray. And so we'd love for you to come and be a part of that this next week. And so that's my action step for you, in addition to asking the question. But as we kind of come to an end, I want to read this in Luke chapter 7. Verse 40 through 42. Then Jesus answered. (laughs) I love this. Then Jesus answered his thoughts. That's curious, isn't it? He knew his thoughts. And so he answered them. Before he even said anything. (laughs) That's so, oh gosh, Jesus. (laughs) He said, Simon. And this is not Peter, the, the one we just talked about. Simon, he said to this Pharisee, he said, I have something to say to you. And Simon, this Pharisee says, go ahead, teacher. Verse 41, he asked him this question. Then then Jesus told him this story. A man loaned money to two people. Yes. 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to the other. But neither of them could repay him. So he kindly forgave them both, canceling the debts. And then he asked this question. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? If you know the story, Simon, being a very smart man, said, well, I guess it was the, I guess it was the one that was forgiven more. I guess it's the one that was forgiven the most amount. And Jesus says, you're absolutely right. And what he's trying to get us to see, all of us, is we're the one that was forgiven the most amount. And the reason this is important is when we live our life from a consistent place of recognizing that he did everything for me, what happens is it causes us to keep that relationship hot, to remember that he's everything that we need, to to make sure that we need to turn up the heat, to be the thermostat we need to be, Because he matters most of all. And the way you learn that he matters most of all is you see in light of the cross, in light of your debt before God, that God said forgiven. 
And that's how we keep it going. That's how we stay close to him. That's how we stay in love with Jesus every day of our life. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for this truth. Father, I thank you that as I come face to face with the cross of Jesus Christ, I'm reminded again of everything that you did for me. I'm reminded again of the, the sin that's been forgiven. And I thank you for it. Perhaps you're here today and, and there was something in the message that stirred your heart and, and you just need to get it right with the Lord. Like you, you just say, you know what? I know Jesus, but I've, 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 I've done some things or I've, I've been a little lazy. I've, I've drifted uh, and I, I need to repent. I need to ask his forgiveness. I need to turn and go in a different direction. I need to reprioritize him. I want to pray for you. If you're here today and that's you, I'm just going to pray real quick for you. Jesus, I thank you right now for every person in this room that wants to get it right. Just simply say to the Lord, Lord, forgive me. Lord, I repent of my behaviors. I repent of my apathy. I, I, I repent of my passivity. I, I repent for just drifting. Would you wipe away my sins and would you heal me? Because I so want to make you the priority of my life. I want my relationship with you to be number one. I thank you, God, for hearing my prayer. Now, I don't know your journey, but earlier in the message, I talked about answering this question of how in love with Jesus are you right now, really? And it could be that you would have to say that you don't have that relationship. So it's hard for you to even gauge it. And so I just want to pray for you today. If this is you, I just want to pray for you. If, if, if you would like to enter into a relationship with Jesus, I'm going to pray this prayer and I need, I'd ask you to pray it with me. Church, let's just, let's just pray this prayer together. Just repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I need a Savior. Will you forgive my sins? Wash me clean. Be my savior. I surrender my life to you. Be my Lord. Would you change me from the inside out? Would you fill me with your spirit? I choose this day to worship you and honor you. And follow you today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we just celebrate anybody that was making a decision today?